Now we have the pleasure of having the talk from Professor Serge Hoche. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and I would like to thank van der Leyen to, to have organized this wonderful event and to give me the opportunity to come here and to participate to this uh, symposium to honor Dan, the scientist and the man. And uh, as many other people who have spoken before me, I want to remind the first time we met, I think it was uh, in about 45 years ago, and you had the good taste to choose to come to Paris in May, which is a very beautiful month, but you chose a special month of May, it was in May 68, and so <laughs> it was not that good for physics. I was just starting my PhD, and I think you wanted to see Castler and Claude. I don't know whether you were lucky enough to see them, and that, but uh, we met at that time, and I don't think we spoke a lot about physics, but I had a chance to, uh, talk to, uh, to talk about physics with you a year later, it was in uh, July 69, it was the first time I came to the United States and I visited your lab at MIT and I remember we talked about hydrogen masers, about van der Waals molecules that you were studying in atomic beams, I had never worked with atomic beams and I was amazed at all what you have been able to do starting your research at MIT only a few years before coming from Harvard and uh, building a lab and being able to have this enthusiastic group working with you on, on uh, many interesting fields became really a model for me. I think we really met in, uh, and have been able to exchange not only in science but also on a personal level in uh, Vail, Colorado in 1973 for the first laser spectroscopy meeting. And it was a fantastic time for science because it was the first meeting in which uh, the new tunable lasers were discussed, and these lasers have, been made, have made possible all what we are uh, witnessing today. All the physics uh, that we are doing now, manipulating atoms in all kinds of conditions, have been made possible from that time. So, as you know, uh, what we are doing in Paris is to uh, perform experiments in which we couple Rydberg atoms with cavities, and uh, these two ingredients are very important for our experiments and of course your group, yourself and your group have played a major role in the emergence of these fields dating back from the 1970s and in this talk I would like to make a kind of historical account of these developments which have been very important also for my own research. Uh, immediately after the Veil meeting we started using lasers to explore uh, a lot of atomic states which are impossible to study with ordinary light. And the Rydberg states, lying very close to the ionization limit, were a beautiful example. It was a, it was a full, very large amount of energy levels that we could reach with lasers. And these Rydberg states, which were very weakly bound, had a lot of very interesting properties which you did not encounter in ground or low exciting states. In Paris, we were uh, fascinated by the high sensitivity of these atoms to microwave radiation. Uh, in, you see here the energy levels of uh, uh, sodium atoms. You have ladders of energy levels converging to the ionization limit and the transition between these states were uh, studied by irradiating them with microwaves. And I could do that because I had the luck to interact at that time with Philippe Goua, who is a wizard in microwave technology and we just had to ask him I need microwave at this wavelength and he provided the source and all the equipment and we could do this. So we were already studying this and studying quantum defects and learning about the fine structure of these levels and we were very excited about that. At the same time at uh, MIT uh, Dan was captivated by the sensitivity of these atoms to electric and magnetic fields. And he uh, has shown, for instance, this diagram in which you see in a very graphic way the Stark effect of sodium atoms. You just, you're just stacking spectra which are taken by scanning lasers for increasing values of the electric field and you immediately see the energy diagram and it looks very much like the hydrogen uh, energy uh, diagram and as we learned yesterday, uh, hydrogen is really uh, uh, the atom of choice of Dan, but there are small differences. You see for the low-lying state, uh, you have the quantum defect, the levels are different from hydrogen, and then they merge into the hydrogen manifold. You have uh, anti-crossing and crossings, and a lot of very subtle effects which were studied by Dan uh, 
and his students, uh, among which uh, 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 Rick Freeman is here uh, today. So uh, I'd, we were working in parallel, and uh, I, am, I found uh, last week, uh, quite by chance, this photograph, which is in the book published the Les Ouches Summer School uh, of July 1982, where we are giving lectures. I was lecturing about Rit Bagatov's in cavities, and I think Dan was lecturing about the stark and the magnetic properties of Rit Bagatov's, and we were discussing, uh, uh, I think, I hope, interesting issues on, on this picture. I want to uh, uh, remind ourselves that Gilbert Grimbert, who died, was the director of that school in 1982. And uh, so we developed, uh, discussed a lot during the 1970s and 1980s, and uh, the conclusion was uh, a Physics Today review article that we published in 1989. And I think this is the only paper we published together. And uh, it was a collection, it was a review of the important phenomena which occur when you, you try to modify, to tailor the spontaneous emission of atoms in cavities. So it gave a good, good account of the first period of uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics when, uh, uh, when the uh, focus when, was on this kind of problem. But these experiments open the way to the coherent control of atom-photon interactions and to all the experiments we performed later to test quantum measurement theory and to demonstrate quantum information. So in this uh, lecture, I would like to tell the story of the progressive improvements of cavities and of Rydberg atom manipulations which made this experiment possible. First of all, uh, for, to record the spectra that I showed you on the first uh, uh, slide, you need to have a good detection of these Rydberg states. What we had started to do in Paris was to collect the fluorescent light, which is okay if the level is not too much excited, but if you get to high levels, the uh, fluorescence yield becomes smaller and smaller and the signal deteriorates. And so Dan and his students had the very good idea to use the, sen the, the, the sensitivity of these atoms to electric fields to use this as a detector, so to ionize the atom in an electric field. And they studied this in detail. They showed that there is a sharp threshold which is different for different Rydberg states and that you could use this as a selective way of detecting these states. So it's a very sensitive and selective way to detect the states, and this is a technique that we have been using since then in all our experiments in Paris. I will give you an example on the next uh, slide. This is a paper that we published in 1979. You see, uh, typically we have an atomic beam, pulse lasers which excite them into Rydberg states, and we apply a microwave in this zone, and the microwave is produced in, a cap in an open cavity, kind of fabri perot made out of copper, and at the beginning this cavity was only used to define precisely the zone where the microwave were interacting with the atoms. Then the atom drifts out of the cavity and passed between these condenser plates where we applied a ramp of electric field varying with time. And you see that this field reached at different time the threshold to ionize two Rydberg levels which were connected by the transition that we were studying. And so when the transition occurred, we saw a change in the shape of this ionization signal which we studied as a function of the microwave frequency. And at that time, what we realized that is that if you start with the excited state, which was a 27S in this case, and if the cavity was tuned by just moving the mirrors in resonance with the transition to the lower state, we did not have to apply any microwave. This did not uh, please very much to uh, Philippe Goua because he liked to play with microwaves, so we did not need the microwave source anymore. The system was radiating spontaneously to the lower state. Of course, this was a maser, so it was the first Rydberg maser. But what uh, really interested us at that point is to realize that this uh, laser was got a threshold with very small number of atoms, a few thousand at that time, as opposed to the billions of atoms required in an ordinary maser, hydrogen maser, or in laser physics. And of course, this was due to the huge coupling of this Rydberg atom to microwaves. And we made a remark at the end of the paper saying that if we improved our cavities, we could get to very small absolute numbers. You know, 79, it was the year where uh, Peter Toshek and, and, and Dave observed for the first time a single atom in a trap. So we were very much interested by this and we thought, can we get an experiment in which a single atom will interact with a single photon? And so this was the start of really uh, our search and it was the start of cavity quantum electrodynamics. <coughs> 
So we improved the cavity, and what we did to improve the cavity was to go to superconducting mirrors. We replaced copper by niobium, and we were able to get to the point where single atoms going through the system were uh, undergoing this transient maser effect. You see here a signal, and with decreasing atom numbers, here you have about 1.3 atom per pulse, and you still see a big increase of the final state when you tune the cavity on resonance. So we said uh, that this effect described, in fact, a transient maser approaching threshold with only one, and we were conservative, we said one or two atom in the inverted medium. But of course there is another way to look at this, which was uh, discussed by Ed Purcell in 1946, which is that we enhance the spontaneous emission rate by having a cavity mode coupled of high Q coupled to the atom. And at the same time, as we are doing this experiment, uh, Dan had the idea to do the opposite, that is to inhibit spontaneous emission to turn off the vacuum effect on the atom by just having the atom going through a cavity which could not accommodate a mode that the atom could radiate. And this, so he published that in a paper in 1981, and then a few years later with Randy Hewlett and Eric Hilfer, they did the experiment. And I recall on the next uh, slide how the experiment worked. You have two plates, two conducting plates. You send Rydberg atoms prepared in a circular state, and I will come back to this in a later, later, and the atoms are detected downstream. And what they observed is that the emission at this wavelength, 0.45 40, millimeter, was inhibited when uh, the transition frequency uh, correspond to a wavelength which was larger than twice the gap between the two states. And this is just because the radiation at, this, uh, at the wavelength that the atom wants to emit is forbidden in, inside this, this gap, this gap beyond cutoff. And the way they did that, the clever way they used to show the effect, was not to move the mirrors, but to change by stark effect the frequency that the atoms want to emit. And so they increase the wavelengths, and when the wavelengths passed through the threshold corresponding to the value one here, there was a big increase in the transmission, and by analyzing this kind of shape, they found out that the emission was inhibited. Since then, many other experiments have been done, and in fact, when I was at Yale a, few, a couple of years later, I did a similar experiment at the, in the, at the, optic, in the optical domain by sending cesium atoms through a very small gap, and we saw basically the same effect. So, why circular atoms in this case? You need circular atoms because you want Rydberg atoms which can radiate only at microwave frequency. If the atom is in a low angular momentum state, it will radiate at optical frequencies which will dominate the process and you will not see this. So you need circular atoms and this brings me to a very important part of this talk because the circular Rydberg atoms are the ones which we have been using as workhorses for all our experiments uh, for reasons which will become clear in a moment. So what is a circular atom? It's an atom in which you take an electron from the ground straight and you promote it into a circular orbit which, whose size is about 1,000 times larger than the size of the ground state. And the preparation, I will come back to this in a moment, is complex and it requires lasers to feed energy in the system and radio frequency to feed angular momentum. And the method to excite these atoms was developed by Randy Hewlett and, and Dan before they did the, circular, the inhibition experiment. I think it's also appropriate to talk about the circular atom today because this atom is an example, it's the, it's the atom of the first theory of quanta that Bohr developed just a hundred years ago in 1913. The model of an electron going around in a circle uh, is indeed this Bohr model and where Bohr quantized this model, he used the quantization of angular momentum. Now I can do it in a way which is a little bit more modern by using this concept of De Bois wavelengths. You could look at this electron as a running wave around the orbit and you have to feed an integral number of De Broglie wavelengths and this number is precisely the principal quantum number. And if you write this, you get the Rydberg formula immediately. And so it is really, and, and, and it looks very similar to the arguments that Bohr used in, in his paper. So this is a Bohr atom, and you see that in this Bohr atom, uh, the, wave, the uh, wave function is uniform here. You don't have an electric dipole. For experiments you need, that we uh, will be discussing, you need an electric dipole, and for that what you have to do is just to admix two Rydberg states with 
the principal quantum never changing by one unit. If you do that, you get a in classical interference effect of the De Broglie waves. You have a De Broglie wave which has 50 nodes and a De Broglie wave which has 51 nodes. So they add up at one end of the orbit and they cancel at the other end. And now you have an electric dipole which rotates at 50 gigahertz. And this localized wave packet, which is even closer to the classical atom, you just have a wave packet going around. And this wave packet goes around without losing its shape because you have only two states. And uh, this is exactly a semi-classical Bohr atom. And you could look at it as a kind of needle, the, uh, the hand of a clock, and the orbit as a dial of a clock. And I will come back to this image later. But this kind of uh, physics became possible because Dan developed uh, this, this physics of Rydberg atom in circular states. The first very important point to notice is that the ionization of these states is very sensitive uh, uh, upon the angular momentum. You see small angular momentum states ionize in a smaller field, this is a ramp of electric field, than the maximum L value, the circular state. The circular states are the ones which are the most impervious to electric field, so you need a larger field to ionize them. And the, the, the change in the shape of this ionization curve is a way you can follow, that you can uh, find out whether you have been able to prepare a circular state or not. Now, the way you prepare the circular state is symbolized here. You first have to use lasers to get into a high-lying manifold, but of course, when you use a few photons, you get in low angular momentum states. This is the kind of states that were reached in the experiments that I discussed at the beginning to get the stark spectra. And when you do that, you see that you have a high degeneracy which is split by an electric field. And if you increase the, uh, the angular momentum, of course, the number of, of, of states that you can reach decreases, and in fact, the levels are organized according to a triangle like this, and the circular state is here at the tip of the triangle. And the techniques that Dan and Randy uh, used was just to apply an electric field to get this fan of levels, and then use radio frequency photons to feed angular momentum according to an adiabatic process and to get into the circular state. We adapted this method in our experiment, making, uh, adding a few tricks to, to make it work in our, in our system. I think Dan did it with n equal 22, and we work with n equal 50, so it requires adapting a little bit, but basically it is the same method, and we get it with very high purity circular states, which we are still using today. So let's come back now to my story back in the 1980s. Uh, we observed the enhancement of spontaneous emission, but we wanted to do more. We said, what happens if we still increase the Q of the cavity? And we said that if we could increase it by a factor of about 10 at that time, we would reach a regime of quantum mechanical oscillation between a two-level atom and a single electromagnetic field mode. What we wanted to do is to have a cavity good enough not only to have a fast photon emitted in the cavity, but to be able for the atom to reabsorb this photon at a later time and for the system to become to oscillate. This is called now the strong coupling regime of cavity QED, and it became really our holy grail. We really wanted to achieve uh, this regime, and for that we needed a better cavity. So what, uh, what would, why would this be interesting? You see we have here an excited atom with zero photon. It emits a photon and goes to the lower state, and then if the cavity is good enough, it can reabsorb the photon, and you get what is called a vacuum Rabi oscillation. If you look at the formula, you find that you have an oscillation between these two states, E0 and G1. This is a very simple model, omega being the Rabi frequency. And you see that if you interrupt this at half for a pi over two pulse, you get a non-local entanglement. The atom leaves the cavity and leaves behind either the vacuum or one photon. And even if the system is separated in space, this entanglement survives. And what you do when the atom has an effect on the cavity field. So we're very... Uh, conscious of this, the beautiful physics we could do. And uh, uh, in 1982, we were thinking about that. You see, if you look at the blackboard, here it's written single atom effect. And here you have the formula of the vacuum rabi oscillation. So at that time, it was purely theoretical. And you see, uh, there are two things I want to stress here. First of all, it was a time where we did not have uh, PowerPoint. So we had to write on the blackboard. And I think it might be better, f I think it was better for the students because we had to do it slowly. It, you had to avoid to have a messy blackboard and you have more, more of to avoid to have messy hands and messy crosses after that because of a choke. So 
But still, you see, uh, I, I try to manage to have a blackboard with lines and so on. Uh, another remark I want to make, uh, from that time we called uh, our vacuum rabbit frequency, we called it capital omega in our work, and everybody else is calling this G. So if you want to find out whether it's a paper coming from our group or from someone else, just look at the uh, letter we use for this. I think we did not want to use G because for us G was a lower state of the atomic transition. So we, we took a Greek letter for the rabbit frequency. So we wanted to improve the Q of our cavities. They were made out of niobium. Niobium is a very good superconductor, but it's a very poor metal for machining. And the surface of our mirrors were, had imperfections, which were scattering the photons outside, and so we could not get a good Q, a very good Q. And then we heard from uh, the people in Munich that Herbert Walter uh, got into the high uh, the strong coupling regime, using a very interesting trick. What they did is just to replace our open cavity by a closed cylinder. And in this case, even if the in inside the surface of the cylinder has imperfections, the photons have to stay inside, just modify a little bit the mode. And they were able to build this device in which atoms going one by one through the system and detected by the same feed ionization method as I described before, were le leading to a micro a system which was producing photons and the quantum field inside the cavity. So he solved the problem using a closed cylindrical cavity which has a photon lifetime which was exceeding ours by three orders of magnitude. In fact, the student who did that experiment was Dieter Meschede, who later on became a postdoc in my group in, when I was at Yale, and now he's a very good colleague with whom we are exchanging students' IDs, postdocs, and it's very really fantastic to work with him. And uh, I wanted also to acknowledge the, uh, the important role played by Herbert Walter in, in this physics in the 1980s. So uh, we also shifted to closed cavities and were able to perform an exp to, to build what we call a two-photon micromaser, but this is a different story. Uh, this uh, picture shows that the micromaser operates in the strong coupling regime. This it shows as a function of time the probability for an atom to exit the cavity in, in one or the other state as a function of time when there is a small thermal field in the cavity. And the fact that this thing oscillates, this signal oscillates, is a proof of the strong coupling regime. The shape is rather complicated because it's not oscillating in vacuum, it's oscillating in a thermal field. So, but it means that the conditions for the strong coupling regime are satisfied. So we were already puzzled at that time, and we decided, do we stick to our open cavities or do we shift to closed cavity? At the same time, and I want to just to uh, mention this here, the strong coupling regime was reached in the optical domain. Then you have to use very small fabry perros and sand atoms, and now it's more often made with cold atoms, and by scanning the lasers, they could look at the spectrum of this atom in the cavity, and the split in the spectrum here, which is here observed for the first time, uh, is, is just a Fourier transform of the Rabi oscillation. So the optical dom in the optical dom domain, cavity QED entered in the strong coupling regime only a couple of four or five years after uh, the experiment of the microwave domain. And of course, a big, a great pioneer in this domain is uh, Jeff Kimball in Caltech, who is still doing very beautiful experiments, but I don't have time to discuss them here. But what is the problem with the closed cavities? Why don't we... Did, uh, we not shift to closed cavities. The problem is that we want to work with circular Rydberg states because they have a long lifetime. And the circular Rydberg states need an electric field to survive. You need a directing field to protect them from getting perturbed by uh, being coupled to lower angular momentum states of the same energy. So you have to remove the, the energy by using a Stark effect. And of course, we know since undergraduate studies that if you put a cavity around an electric field, the electric field vanishes because of the Gauss theorem. So you cannot apply an electric field in a closed cavity, which means that the circular state loses its bearings and is no longer circular. So this was a kind of a puzzle for us, and I remember discussing with Dan in the 1980s, the idea was to cut these cavities using a dielectric uh, gap, and to put, of course, the gap at a clever place where the electric field is zero so that it would not affect the Q of the cavity. And so we thought about this kind of structure, but it never worked. And in fact, 
the, the Q of this cavity remained poor, and moreover, there is another problem. When the atom exits the small hole, there are stray fields due to the patch effect, which perturbs also this system. So, in order to control the Rydberg atoms, we found it necessary to come back to open structures with high-quality surfaces, and so we came back to our open cavities. And uh, we, uh, it took us a long time. We had to improve over many, many years the quality of our mirrors, and we ended up by having mirrors made out of copper, which can be machined with high precision, and sputtering a thin layer of niobium on top of the copper. And you see here the improvement of the Q of our cavity from about one microsecond back in the 1990s up to 100 milliseconds now, so five order of magnitude improvement. And we crossed the strong coupling limit here about in 1995, uh, where this means that then we have one rabi oscillation during the lifetime of the photon, and now we have about 5,000 rabi oscillation within the lifetime of a photon in the cavity, which uh, uh, allowed us to perform all the experiments that we did during the last, last 15 years. So the, the principle of the experiment is very simple. We send uh, between these mirrors, uh, the photon can bounce more than a billion times before being lost, and so we send atoms one by one, they couple to the field, and then they are destroyed in the end, and we get the information from the field ionization signal. You see here the vacuum rabi oscillation that we got in 1996, and you see that uh, if you stop the rabi oscillation here, you entangle the atom and the photon, you prepare this state. If you, look, if you stop here, you go from E0 to G1, and you generate one photon on demand. So we did a lot of experiments uh, on qu about uh, quantum gates, quantum information doing this, but the last problem I want to discuss is how to detect this photon if you produce a photon without destroying it. Can we do experiments which look like atom in traps? We have a photon, but we can look at it and look at it without having to absorb it. And for that, uh, I want to mention the roles played by our PhD advisors, uh, Claude Cointanuji and Norman Ramsey, because we used tricks that they had, they had introduced in this field of physics before we started our own work. We used to, to detect the photons without destroying it, the light shift effect, which was uh, understood by Claude Cointanuji in his thesis. A non-resonant atom, we need non-resonant atoms not to absorb the photon, undergoes a light shift which goes in opposite direction for the atom in, in level E and G. And this light shift produces a phase shift proportional to the photon number. And this effect is so big for a Rydberg atom that when the atom leaves the cavity, whether you have zero or one photon, you can have a dipole which will take one phase or the opposite phase. And to detect that, you just, by measuring delta phi, you will count the photon without destroying them. How do you measure a phase shift? You use a, an interferometer and you use a Ramsey interferometer. You have an, in fact, what we have built is an atomic clock which is delayed by the photons which are trapped inside the clock. The, the ticking rate of this atomic clock is altered by the light shift induced by the microwave field, and a single photon can delay the clock by one second per month. Of course, uh, people who build atomic clocks now, uh, which are a precision of five seconds in the age of the universe, we laugh at one second per month, but we do exactly the opposite of what Dave is doing. Dave is trying to protect his clock from everything, and we try to use the clock, which is strongly perturbed by something, which is here the photon number. So what we have to, the situation that we realize is just a situation in which a single photon shifts by half a fringe. We have to tune here, and whether you have zero or one photon, you will get an atom in one state or in the other. In fact, we proposed this in a paper published in 1990, and it took us 16 years to realize the experiment. So this gives you an idea of the kind of time scale which is required for this kind of experiment. And on the next uh, uh, slide, I show you the signals that we got in 2006. The atoms are going out in one state, and suddenly you see a change. This is a photon which survived for half a second. You see the quantum jump of the light. You see that hundreds of atoms see the same photon, and this Ramsey interferometer has also been used as a quantum gate and to perform a lot of experiments in quantum information. So I reached the conclusion now. What I want to say is that uh, using this technique, we have learned progressively 
the ways to generate photon on demand, to keep them alive for a long time. Here you see, for example, what you can do by quantum feedback. You can stabilize a photon number from zero to seven photon. We can decide which photon number we want to have in the cavity and to keep it there for as long as we want. We can also uh, demonstrate basic steps of quantum information, generate and reconstruct non-classical state of radiation. Here is an example of a Schrodinger cat state study their decoherence. But uh, what I want to stress here is that the methods which have enabled us to perform these experiments owe a lot to the work of Dan, to the legacy of our mentors, and of course to outstanding colleagues and students who, who have accompanied us during all these years. And I want to stress the very important role played by Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Boyne, who have been my students in the 1970s and 1980s, and who have been able to keep uh, in my group, and all this has been done in close collaboration with, of course, a lot of other people. And the last generation of students and postdoc is shown in this picture, which was taken last, last fall. So I stop here and thank you. Not a question, but a comment. Okay. Which is, thank you for <laughs> your generous acknowledgement of the work that I did in the field. I feel privileged to be in a position to really appreciate what you have done, and I've been a great fan of this for some time. It's truly extraordinary, and I haven't had a chance to congratulate you publicly for the prize this year, which Thank has you. given the whole field great pleasure, and Dave Wineland also. They have been uh, applauded numerous times and uh, probably tired of having people applaud them. But I would like to take this occasion for our community right here to congratulate them for this wonderful contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to add just a comment again. This means a lot to me, what you just said. It's very, it's the most moving congratulation that I got coming from you. So continuing the, uh, the theme of telling stories, um, I'd like to tell a story, a very brief one, um, about something that relates to the cavity QED and in fact the, the two photon maser. In the, must have been mid-1980s, um, uh, I have to preface this by reminding everybody that I work for the United States government. Mm -hmm. Now in the mid-1980s things were a little bit different from when they are now and when we went on foreign trips we had to write a report and the report went to the CIA among other organizations. And Paul Lett went on a trip to um, attend a meeting about antimatter uh, because there was a lot of talk about trapping antimatter in atom traps and then using it to do all sorts of interesting things. And he stopped by your laboratory on the way back from that meeting and you uh, uh, told him about the two-photon maser, as I recall. And he wrote a report in which he talked about the antimatter, the antimatter meeting and uh, the, uh, the two-photon maser as well, since he'd uh, uh, talked to you about that. And then the report went off, and then um, if the report was interesting enough, we would get a visit from uh, the CIA lady. And the CIA lady would come to our lab and talk to us about what, uh, what we'd learned on this, um, on this foreign trip uh, to find out whether you know, American intelligence uh, needed to know about this stuff. We thought, well, gee, you know, uh, Antimatter, this sounds like pretty, uh, pretty dangerous stuff. The CIA probably wants to know all about that. No, they wanted to know about the, the two-photon maser. <laughs> so I thought you might be interested that, uh, that, that your work came to the attention of the CIA. Um, I, I think it was because they figured that masers were sort of like lasers and a two-photon maser had to be much more powerful. <laughs> I must tell you that I have lost interest because I never heard about them. <laughs> yeah, I think they finally figured out maybe it wasn't. They, they, they must have finally figured out it wasn't all that powerful. <laughs> so let's thank Professor Harash again.